so here we are in the Digital Scholarship Commons, and we've got Eric Moe from the Music Department, Jeff Suzik from the Falk Laboratory School, Nathan Clark from Computational and Systems Biology, and Jocelyn Monahan from the iSchool, the School of Information Sciences. Sorry. <laughs> And so we've got a lot of people to thank. We've got the, you know, the Office of the Provost and the Year of the Humanities Funding, um, the Humanities Center. We need to thank um, the Department of Biology in the Dietrich School um, and the University Library System uh, for hosting this evening and the Carnegie Museum of Natural History for being our community partner through this. And in particular, I would like to thank Noreen Jaren and her team because Without them, that's Noreen, um, this, none of this would be running smoothly without her. So we're very grateful for everything um, that she does for events here. Um, so that said, um, we also have four curiosity interns. So if you guys could stand up so everybody knows who you are, OK? <laughs> <laughs> and the one with the mic, Margaret, if you could wave. So. When you have questions this evening, Margaret is going to come and help you uh, speak into the mic. We are recording, and so it's important that we get your questions recorded that way. There's another option for question questions. So you'll see there are scraps of paper and pencils scattered around and extras over there with the interns. And so if you would be more comfortable submitting your question on paper, we welcome you to do that. Just sort of wave the paper around and one of the interns will come and grab it and bring it up here and I'll, I'll read it, okay? Um, so those are your question answer, you know, asking options. And the other job that the interns have, which we're very excited about, is to respond to this evening's uh, conversation through blog posts, okay? We have two interns from the humanities and two from the sciences. However, there's some interesting crossover, okay? We've got an art history and math major in the same human. And <laughs> we, have, um, we have biology and English, am I right? Yeah, okay, so that's also a nice combo. Um, so we'll have some great insight that you all can read on our Frick Fine Arts Library uh, Tumblr site, and we'll be sure to send the links out to that. Okay, great. So, um, Let's get started on our discussion. So tonight we're focusing on tools and how tools can, um, you know, how, how do we engage with tools? How do they promote curiosity? How, can they constrain curiosity? Um, and what can we learn about curiosity by just sort of pausing and, and noticing how we engage with tools? And um, so I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what you do in life and then um, how you respond to the topic for the evening. And then we'll see where the discussion goes from there. And so I encourage you all to ask questions throughout and we'll incorporate them as best we can. So, Eric. Oh, oh and I have to show the mic. <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, I'm Eric Moe. I'm a composer and a pianist I'm from time to time. Um, and uh, I write music, and I also teach computer music here, so I do some uh, work with high-tech tools as well as low-tech tools. Um, it's hard for me to imagine doing work or, or being able to explore sound the way I do uh, with, without tools of, of all kinds. I compose at the piano or with an instrument available. Um, many of our instruments are low-tech instruments, but some of them are extremely sophisticated. If you think about a violin, for instance, um, that's the product of centuries of the best and the brightest trying to tweak a design and get the maximum amount of resonance and aesthetic properties of all kinds, beauty of, of, of the way it looks as well as just the way it sounds, for instance. Um, I brought a tool. I cheated and brought some of my tools here. Um, so let me show you my sophisticated tool that I brought. That's a, that's, that's a preview of it. Okay, this, this is a chow gong from China. It sounds nice. I'm going to shut, cut it short because it'll ring for quite a while. And it may look simple, but it's actually 
a quite sophisticated instrument. Um, if you want to take a look afterwards, it's got lots of lots of layers of wire. It's, it makes sound in uh, different places on the circle. I'm going to use a smaller mount. These are some of the humble tools that I use. This is a Super Bowl on a stick. <laughs> and um, one of the exciting things about, uh, we're always looking for new sounds because we're curious <laughs> and we want to find um, new sounds. And the nice thing about Super Balls is any rigid surface that, has, that you can make vibrate will vibrate. So you can also just use them to whack things with. So you can hear there are at least three sounds on that gong. But if I rub the gong, really interesting things start to happen. Uh, it can suggest speech. And then, of course, wonder what will happen if I do this. So, so producing sounds and really coming up with interesting sounds is, is half of it. And then the next fun thing is sticking them together. And this is where some of the high-tech tools come in. Um, and I use those too. I happen to have one here. Um, these are tools for recording and analysis and overlapping. Here's one called, uh, Spect it's an app called Spectrogram Pro. And what it does is it takes the, the white light of sound, passes it through a prism of Fourier analysis and, and maps the, uh, sort of displays what's coming out of the, and isolates the different frequency components of the sound. So you can see when I sing a sound, uh, Uh, you can see not just the one note, but you see all the components of that note. Sorry, I didn't warm up. <coughs> um, but and you'll see all of the the the, the vowels in my speech, a o, are going to map differently as they come out. So we can use this. Compo we composers can use things like this to show the difference between, and to think about the difference between combining sounds. Which isolate very different frequency areas. I hope that's working. <laughs> I can't. In addition to finding lovely sounds wherever we can. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you're welcome to try one of these out too when, uh, <laughs> afterwards. Um, so finally, if we stick when we're sticking things together, sounds together that have never been stuck together before. I mean, we're not just doing this for the hell of it. Um, I mean, we're doing it because we're curious about things. But the 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 end goal is to produce a piece of music that's going to make you think about wonder what's going to happen next and I wonder when it's going to happen and if we can mess with either of those sets of expectations we've done our job in other words we want to make you curious about the next event in a piece and if we can either give that to you ahead of time or delay it just after when you expect it's going to be you're going to have an exciting experience or if you're going to get if it comes exactly when you expect it but it's something way different than what you thought was going to happen. Then we've done done our job using tools. Okay. Thank you. Hi everyone. Again, uh, my name is Jeff Suzik, and um, I feel completely out outmatched by this task <laughs> now because the only tool I have is this little glass of red wine um, in front of me. Um, when I think about tools as the director of the Falk Laboratory School, where if you're unfamiliar with what we do, we're a school that is affiliated with the School of Education. 
and we serve about 400 students on this campus who are between the grade levels of kindergarten and eighth grade. Um, and those students then go out to any number of secondary schools and colleges after they leave us. We were a school that was founded in the progressive tradition in the tail end of the progressive period. So unlike John Dewey's school, the first lab school that was founded in the 1890s at the University of Chicago, we were founded a, a, a generation later in 1931. So we were... Uh, the uh, recipients, you know, greatly of all kinds of progressive educational theories that were in their full flowering by the early 1930s. And quite unlike the lab schools at the University of Chicago, which are no longer lab schools, there's no school of ed at the University of Chicago any longer for them to affiliate with, we are still an old school progressive with a capital P institution, which is something that I think we're very proud of. There's a couple of things that relate to tools that I think we do on a daily basis with our students who range anywhere from 5 to 14. Um, and that is that we follow inquiry-based pedagogical models. So we ask lots of open-ended questions. We don't give children lots of answers to things that might, we might very conveniently just simply answer for them. We want them to actually explore with wonder and curiosity different things and concepts that are part of their life. And that piece about being part of their lives is also very important to us because we also follow, among many other things, something that we would call uh, a focus on emergent curriculum. And so ideas come to us from the children themselves. So if they become obsessed, for instance, with building lakes and rivers and other sorts of things in their playgrounds, we might actually develop some sorts of uh, units of study that relate to their specific emergent interests. So one of the things that I would use when I'm thinking about tools are all the things that I observe on a regular basis, the many different kinds of tools that children use as they're learning, and that we, with some intention and some not-so-intentional ways, introduce them to. So for instance, um, at the very beginning of kindergarten in our kindergarten program, and there are 48 children in two different kindergarten classrooms, so 24 in each room, the children are brought together in their classrooms in the very first week of school and they're each gifted with a small pot of white paint. And that small pot of white paint becomes their tool, really, for the artwork that they will create for the remainder of the year. So our art teacher speaks to them about hue and color and what happens when you mix different essences and what, and what you might um, make if you take orange essence and purple essence and you make something entirely different. So the children think about this collectively and individually, and then they make their essences of paint, they mix them, and then they brand them and they name them. So it might be Bubblegum Pink by Kaylin. It might be um, Salamander Green by Ian. And those pots of paint, those 48 pots of paint, become their palette for the rest of the year. And that becomes their tool for all of the artwork that they create. And why we do this is that this helps us to create a sense of oneness, that these paints belong to them as a group, but they each have ownership over one particular pot. When they run out of that color, they make it again. And so this is one of the ways that I think is an intriguing sense of a tool, that the paint itself is a multi-dimensional tool for children's learning. Uh, the second bit is something that I was told recently, and again, it's a kindergarten story, so I forgive me for just telling kindergarten stories. Um, but kindergarten at Falk School is really pretty cool. So if you ever want to come and visit and see it, if you need a little pick-me-up from your regular day lives and whatever it is that you do, kindergarten is a good place to go. Um, so the kindergartners were having an open-ended, inquiry-based discussion about the fact that one of them loves bicycles and their family loves bicycles and that the bicycles um, in their household are plentiful because one of the parents, I don't remember which one, builds and tinkers with old bicycles. And so they've been learning a lot in their technology classes about machines. And of course, machines are tools. Um, but we don't have children using digital devices at Falk School until they get to third grade. So they're not on iPads. They don't go to computer labs. They basically take apart technology and learn about the circuitry. So that's pretty much what we do for those first fundamental years. So kids were inquiring about the fact that what do machines do? What constitutes a machine? And one of the first things that one of the children said, according to the kindergarten teacher, I wasn't there, was that machines are tools. And the children said, well, what is a tool? And children said, well, a tool is something that helps you do something better that you already would have been doing. And someone else said, no, no, no. A tool is something that actually helps you do something that you couldn't do otherwise. So of course, these are two very different definitions of tool both of them that were emerging from the curiosity of children. Um, 
And uh, ultimately, they started to say, well, maybe tools, maybe machines that are tools have to have an energy source that is not human. So is a bicycle a tool then? It helps you get to a place more quickly and more efficiently than you otherwise would. So maybe that's a tool. Maybe it's just a machine. Um, and then a child said, but it doesn't have a motor. You have to do it yourself. And I said, well, okay, so does it need to have a motor? I said, well, is a toothbrush a tool? It helps you clean your teeth, but again, you have to use your own human power. But of course, some smart child said, what about an electronic toothbrush? Um, and so these are the types of conversations I think that enrich children's lives to have them with them, build a sense of curiosity, wonder, and inquiry in them, and they just happen to be about the use of tools. Thanks, that was great. Um, my name is Nathan Clark. Um, I wear a few hats in the field of biology. I'm a geneticist, but I'm also an evolutionary biologist, so this got me to thinking that essentially, uh, through my studies, I study tools, but tools that are used by non-humans, and let me explain. Uh, a large amount of the research in my lab in involves searching for the specific adaptations that are encoded in DNA that allow certain species to do things that others cannot, right? And if you think about it, that's in a way a tool, right? It's allowing them to overcome certain challenges that they encounter in their environment or in their social areas or in their daily lives. Um, and we aren't so different. I, I guess we've just learned to make tools in not in a genetic way, in the way they're encoded in our DNA, but we can construct them like these uh, microphones that you have before us, right? And what this has enabled us to do, if you think about it in evolutionary terms, it's these basic tools have enabled curiosity in its first step, in its most basic essence. Because if you're struggling just to survive every day, just to get enough to eat, you really can't afford curiosity, right? Uh, in fact, our ancestors were probably just a few generations away from uh, times when just one bad harvest was all that was between you and starvation. And so back in those days, curiosity was probably seen as kind of an idle waste of time in lots of households and families. And you have to kind of remember it in that context. And, and it might somehow be in the daily lives of many people today. So in that sense, tools that enable us to have leisure time and to ponder things like the orbits of planets and how gravity works uh, what's perceived in uh, social interactions between each other, uh, those are fundamentally enabled by tools that allow us to live more freely in our lives. Uh, in what we do, uh, of course, I like, like everyone before me, I couldn't imagine doing what I do without the tools that we have. We have machines to sequence DNA and computers to study the sequences of DNA that are millions and millions of letters long, and these, of course, would not be possible without these tools. Um, so that's where biology has essentially taken all the major steps forward. When, when you can answer a certain set of questions observationally, beginning with very simple things like my own field of genetics, it began with Gregor Mendel. Uh, he was just wondering how it is that certain varieties of peas appear different from others, and it's inherited, right? And so he just did garden experiments um, in the monastery for several years and figured this out observationally. Um, I guess that wasn't as tool dependent as the field is now. He, he wouldn't recognize the field. But essentially with every new tool, it has allowed us to go in and explore different questions about how things are inherited in different questions about what adaptations we have and what other species have as well. So there's perhaps a uh, perspective from my field of what tools we have and uh, what they've enabled us to do. Um, my name is Jocelyn Monaghan, and I'm a PhD student at the School of Information Sciences in uh, Library and Information Science. And uh, my research has to do with so, um, the social aspects of technology, and my, re uh, my teaching does as well. So I teach a class called uh, Creative Engagements with Digital Technology. And in that class, um, which is a master's level class, 
uh, my students who are librarians are encouraged to work with a number of different digital tools to produce projects uh, that they come up with on their own. And it turns out that master's courses are not that different from kindergarten because the question, <laughs> the question that we struggle with the most is uh, they'll bring in an idea, right? And the assignment structure is iterative. So I'll say, okay, bring me in an idea for something you want to do and the tool you want to do with it and, and tell, me, tell me why you think that'll work. And then they bring it in and then I'm, I'm, I say like, okay, now go try it and tell me if it worked. And then almost inevitably it didn't work, right? Uh, and then I say, okay, well, tell me why. And so by the end of the class, they go through a couple of different tools to produce the project that they need. And while they're doing that, uh, what, I, what I want them to do is figure out how different tools will let them work with a different subject um, in unique ways. So for example, I had one student we learned a, a language just really briefly called processing. And processing, uh, what it does really well actually is model algorithmic evolution. So it's used by scientists, but it's also really friendly. So it's used by humanities people to program stuff. And my student was an artist and what he wanted to do was something really algorithmic and cool where he generated different color palettes and he had no programming experience. But he got this like bee in his bonnet because he saw it and he saw that this is the thing he would need to do to do that. And so we would have these meetings where we would sort of wrestle with, with how to do it. And he ended up spending the whole semester building this like one tool for this, with this programming language. But he, he went on like, like this incredible journey that he presented for his final project, right? Where he like emailed a bunch of people who like made the language and like he got some sample code from someone else that he, that he had to modify for his own uses. And then at the end of the semester, he, he had it, he did it. And he gave the best presentation I've ever seen on how to code and how to learn to code because he had to do it and he let his curiosity lead him. Like he had an idea and then he and, and, and he traveled through like the world of this tool to get there. I had another student uh, who had OCD and she wanted to figure out how to create an interactive fiction story using the tool Twine um, where you experience uh, the day in the life of someone with obsessive compulsive disorder. And I said, okay, well, how, how do we break down obsessive compulsive disorder? Like, what are, what are the different aspects that you want to represent in this game? And so what she decided on was thinking about the different things in her mood. Like, is she getting, is she getting too obsessive? Is she getting anxious? Is she getting depressed? And once you hit a certain threshold based on the decisions that you make, um, you shut down because that's what happens in real life, right? She's unable to function whenever she reaches a certain point. And so, um, this topic that we're discussing today is really interesting to me uh, because when I teach this class, what I'm doing is basically throwing a bunch of tools. I do one tool a week, right? I throw a bunch of tools at, at these students and say, okay, figure out how to use that tool to do something. And this is a slightly different definition from where your students arrive. I said, use that tool to do something that you couldn't do otherwise. Um, not that like you, you couldn't do it yourself, but also you couldn't do it with a different tool. It needs to have a unique stamp on it based on that specific thing that you're using. And so what's interesting to me about this topic is thinking about the ways that tools uh, allow you to do something unique and leave that sort of imprint on whatever, whatever concept or work you're doing. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, way over here. She's going to bring the mic over to you. Oh. Everybody speak closer to the mic, it sounds okay. like. Okay. Okay. Thank you for letting us know. Does anybody have a question? Oh, Steve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's the tool. Here's the tool. <laughs> So tools enable you to explore, but they also constrain the ways that you explore, right? So I wonder how that plays into the ways in which we can be curious and the ways in which we can't. Does anyone want to respond to that? Yeah. So uh, before I uh, became the director of a K-8 school, in a former life I was a PhD student and then finished a PhD in American history. So I didn't come to education through an education program. I came to it through historical research. And the historical research that I did, and this was one of the things that made me so interested in Falk School, is that I'm a historian of, of education, uh, specifically about education in New Deal work programs during the Great Depression. So Falk School, founded in 1931, if you were paying attention, the program that I studied for a decade of my life 
was founded in 1933, the Civilian Conservation Corps. And if you know anything about this particular program, it was one of the most well-known programs during the New Deal. It took working class teenage boys and young men between the ages of 17 and 23, uh, had them work and live on uh, rural, out of the way, usually forested work camps that were run by the military, but were run in the evenings by the Department of Education. And so while boys during the day were working, fighting forest fires, planting trees, um, building public park infrastructure, in the evenings there was lots of societal and internal governmental debate about what they should be doing at night. Um, should they just be shooting pool and hanging out and making kind of bootleg liquor? They did a lot of those things, um, probably using a lot of tools. Uh, pool cue is a tool, I guess, and the still is a tool. Um, but could you actually imagine a promise of America that would be realized for these working class boys at night? And a lot of the arguments between two different camps in the federal government were about tools and about the use of tools and whether or not tools hindered or expanded the... Uh, the life um, possibilities of these young men. So if you only gave them more vocational training at night, which might have been what they, at a time before the expansion of American high school attendance was over 50%, it was still under 50% at this time, most of these boys were high school dropouts, should you just expose them to more tools, give them training in using lathes and skill saws and make them into plumbers and mechanics, very skilled, highly paid occupations, or could you imagine this as an opportunity, they were a captive audience, introduce them to different tools, and one tool that you could introduce them to would be books, or learning, or type of learning that was academic. Get them to study for what was then the equivalent of the GRE, um, and expose them to a world of tools and resources that would then make them into a professional white collar class that was not in their, the cards for them at that particular time in history. So there were these arguments back and forth about what tools would actually liberate this part of the American population to reach their max maximum potential. And some of the most obvious um, feedback that we would think was positive was, well, yes, we should actually make these into little universities in the woods in the evenings because everyone should have access to the tools that will make them into professionals. Mm -hmm. But there were equally strong voices about, actually, these are people who don't want that. What they want is the mechanical and vocational training that will allow them to become skilled workers, not unskilled workers, so we should expose them to more of those tools. And one of the quotes that I love was that one of the, um, one of the federal officials who oversaw educational programs in these camps said at one point, listen, all boys are not Beethovens, so maybe they should be exposed to the kinds of experiences and tools that they need, and that will expand them as opposed to holding them back. Um, so in, in the class that I mentioned, we talked a lot about frustration, uh, which is good. And uh, well, part of the final project, what I told them was, you don't need to finish whatever you're trying to do. I just want to know how you tried to finish it. So part of the final project was they had to keep a, a log and a breakdown of what they spent their time on. Um, and, the, and the first time that they spent, like the biggest for most people, was the brainstorming part where they had the idea and like iterated on that idea once they once they went forward. But um, the second biggest or the biggest part was also always how much time it took them to figure out how to use the tool. And they would do weekly updates and they would come in and be like, I just want to do this really simple, simple task. And I cannot for the life of me make it happen. And so there was a there was a competition happening between them having like this really cool idea that they wanted to make happen, but then like the tool not being intuitive or like just being too complex for them to do it. And so they would hit a wall in terms of um, because they had a really clear vision and they wanted to move it forward. And so I think that uh, part of the problem with tools is that um, uh, it's really easy like when the tool is scraping a super ball across the wall, like it's pretty easy to figure out how to do that and it has really cool results. Um, as you go as you go up in complexity, you're dedicating less time to your curiosity and more time to the tool itself, which can then be carried forward. But if it's your first time, then it, it can be kind of a kind of a troublesome endeavor. That's a really interesting way of thinking about how tools constrain. Because I, I was picking up on a on a different way. Can, can everyone hear me over the fans? Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, I mean, I guess what came to mind for me was the fact that things like search engines can, that's a nice tool, right? But it can really channel you only into certain areas, right? Or 
If you have a microscope, you're going to look at small things, basically, but you might miss the big picture, right? So that's a, another way of thinking about it, perhaps. And, and, and my response to that is, then don't use that tool. Um, I, I think there's, as we create more and more of them, I mean, what's the alternative if you don't have a microscope? You don't look at small things, but you would need a tool to see anything else that the naked eye couldn't capture anyway. So I'm sure you would, you know, human curiosity should overcome that, I would hope. You know, in, in, in the academic world, I think we're, it's, but actually even outside the academic world, I think we're all blessed with a very deep sense of curiosity. And I hope we would overcome that and, and search out the things that can enable us to do things that we do want to be doing. And uh, particularly creative people will adopt a new tool and then forget the rules in a way, kind of like how you know you play jazz, right? You, you learn the rules of the chord progressions, and then to become a good jazz player, you forget them. And and I think tools you with the kind of innate human creativity and curiosity should be treated in the same way, right? That's just my reaction to that. So. Well, I think it's um, from my standpoint. I since I've spent a few decades of my life sitting in front of the same tool, namely a piano keyboard, um, I haven't really felt constrained by that. I mean, I know, and I certainly seek out other modes of expression and, and new tools, and I'm e always eager to embrace them. But there's a lot to be said for continuing to master all of the complexities of one tool that's extremely well designed that has a lot of potential. One of the things that frustrates me about a lot of applications and a lot of digital technology is just as soon as I get, I, I start to acquire a degree of mastery of certain kind and can really make things start to happen with it, then it's upgraded to a new system and all the little <laughs> things that I knew how to get to when it I repurposed and I have to completely retool my, I either have to go into the preferences and change them all back the way I, I had them originally. And it's never quite works as well as I did. So we're never allowed to get that mastery. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues is, uh, um, not at Pitt, but out in the world, is uh, a fellow who made his living doing tape music. He was a pioneer, Mario Davidovsky. Did, uh, these marvelous electroacoustic compositions involving just working with recording magnetic tape and splicing it. And he could never, he felt digital technology had, had sort of ruined his life because he missed the tactile connection that he'd spent, you know, decades again sort of mastering the feel of how much tape would correspond to a few seconds of music and the way in which to, to, uh, to adjoin those things and to create a grasp. So in cre creating art anyway, the, the more high tech isn't necessarily the better, or the more variety isn't necessarily the better. We have a question back here. Barbara? Yeah. It's just more of an observation, um, especially with Eric's work, but I think with all of you, is. I would never have dreamed a Super Bowl tool could do what you are thinking about doing with that. So, so that's a kind of other dimension to this, that a tool doesn't necessarily have a particular outcome sort of pre-inscribed in its physiognomy, for lack of a better word. So, so that's another dimension, it seems to me, that tools, tools in and of themselves are kind of open-ended. So it's figuring that relationship out with curiosity that's, that seems to be at root with a lot of what all of you have said, actually. Right. If we had handed that same mallet to someone else, we may not have gotten that sound. Yeah. Could, could I add a little addendum on it? I mean, it's, it's, that's a great analogy for other fields as well. I mean, you, you would essentially want your tools to be uh, durable, I guess, so they can adapt to being used in different ways, right? And and in, in my own field as a computational biologist, I, I, I can think of some of the most amazing, you know, uh, computer code programming that it has been the most useful tools are the ones that are written in modules and in ways that peop other people can just pick up and readapt to their own purposes or build off of. And, and I guess that same analogy can be taken down to the Super Bowl. 
if I would return to that motif about the, the jar of paint, um, that is a multidimensional tool, and it depends on, I was just thinking that, you know, a tool is a tool in the eye of the, or the hand of the user, right? So that the paint is a tool for children to create art. And it's also a way that the teachers intend for those children to create community, but it's also a teaching tool for the teachers themselves. And so if you're the teacher, you're using it for a particular set of purposes. If you're a child, it's a different kind of tool. So I think that lots of tools are used for different things. I was trying to think of things that people might oddly have in their kitchen that, why is there a wrench in here? Oh, that's because this doesn't work. So I use that to get the ice out of the, you know, it's a tool that was not intended for that. We make it into the thing that we want it to be. I think a, I think a good kitchen example would be my, Microplane, actually, which started as a wood rasp company, and people used it to grate cheese because it was be better than any grater that existed. So Microplane started started making graters, and um, which, but it reminds me of of you talking about the emergent um, learning in your school and and how lesson plans adapt to what people are doing because I think. One of I, I think that's a great point, and one of the most interesting thing that happens with digital tools um, is, uh, so for example, the Xbox Connect, which came out quite a few years ago now, um, was one of the first tools that pays attention to where your body goes and would let you um, act in a game. And what happened was uh, it was uh, copyright protected by Microsoft, and that copyright protection was broken within a day. And people, because it wasn't really widely used in games, but people started making their own games and applications using this new technology that people hadn't really had before. And so um, there's something to be said about, I don't want to say like legitimate and non-legitimate, but like planned and unplanned uses of tools that I think is where some of the richest sites of technology and curiosity are. Great. So I have a couple of paper questions, but I want to start with the microphone question. Yes. Um, I'm a local artist who spent 15 or 16 years mastering a small handful of mediums and have found that through doing that, that one thing after another has, has broadened my horizons about things that have <coughs> made me inquisitive, some of which have led me to the belly of the Natural History Museum, looking through the collections there, which you know, if I'd asked my 21-year-old self if I'd ever be interested in that, the answer would have definitely been no. But I'm curious if you can respond to, and this is sort of a segue to the previous question, is if today's day and age of technology and digital culture helps or hinders the youngest generation's um, curiosity. Because I find that they focus more on ideation and not on the implementation and really following through on a practice or a medium and exploring that through and actually mastering something instead of just hopping from one thing from the next. And in the case of the arts, work is quite often pretty poor because of a lack of a technical proficiency. So I'm curious if you think, does it help or does it hinder curiosity? Okay, so as the kid person, um, <laughs> supposedly, I'll answer. Um, I think it depends. I think, and that's kind of a weak answer, but I think it's probably both and. And so, but I will just focus on the hindering part. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that at Falk School, for all kinds of complex reasons, we limit children's access to digital devices until they're in third grade, so until they're about nine. Um, so that we know that they're using digital devices at home, we know that they have iPads, we know that they probably know how to do searches on computers, but we intentionally do our education around technology to be about circuitry and how technology itself works, to make them curious about what's inside machines, not just simply being passive consumers, but active creators of things. And so one of the things that you would notice if you came to the Falk School is that there are lots of old school progressive things that go on, like the building of things with blocks. And so we've got big blocks and little blocks and Legos and other kinds of connect sticks and things that children are often building with independently, not just in the classroom in an organized kind of fashion, but in the hallways and little alcoves. And we leave, leave these up for a very long time. How we've actually added a digital piece to this or a technology piece to this is that our technology teacher, who is a computational lingu linguist, she has created wired circuits that children learn how to create so that they can animate their block play. So they 
flip a switch and it knocks everything over because that's what kids really want to do when they build something is knock it back over and then rebuild it. So instead of having them live in a virtual world, we have them live in this world first. And it's our supposition, it's also our, um, our anecdotal observation that children become much more open and curious about inquiring about the world around them because we do these things. Um, now, up until two months ago, the American Association of Pediatrics agreed with us, but they changed their mind. And so now they said, you know what, we live in a technology-rich world. If you can't beat them, join them. So children can have digital devices as young as you think is appropriate as a family. We're not holding with that. We're sticking with our philosophy. I teach a, I teach a youth and technology course as well. And we had a, we had a day where we struggled with um, how to balance Lego versus Minecraft. Um, because so many libraries implement Minecraft programs. And so many libraries have problems with Minecraft programs. Because there are no non-digital consequences. People will go around knocking other other people's stuff down, right? People will blow stuff up. And so I think that um, it's a really interesting example where it's basically the same function where you're building stuff, but the behavior can be drastically different and the type of lesson that can be learned is also drastically different. Yeah. Just to inject a contrarian note of a sort, um, I mean, I, I am essentially in total agreement <laughs> with with my colleagues here, but um, I just I want to note that there is a, a sort of a surprising resilience of low tech hanger on behavior. I mean, there is a continual survival of analog instruments. Who would have guessed that? I mean, we've had electric instruments around for a hundred years now, uh, or close to it. Um, you know, and they're wonderful. They're fantastic. They can do everything. They're cheaper. They're better. They don't have to be tuned. Um, but yet, people are still spending hours of their lives learning chords on a guitar. <laughs> and uh, and it's not that the quality of musicians have gone down. In fact, it's, if anything, it's we've got more fantastic musicians now than ever in in the history of the planet. So, and we got records being made on vinyl for Christ's sake. I mean, so you know, there is this weird thing going on, split going on, that, you know, the geeks of the world are definitely spending a lot of time in front of computers, but other geeks of the world are also spending a lot of time at doing things that have nothing to do with sort of drowning in the sea of information. We have a few paper questions I want to insert here. So they're all great. This is so much fun. Um, so the question is, so why don't we play jazz with our search engines? What makes some tools playful and others more deadpan? Who wants it? So that was directed at me. <laughs> 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 but feel free to chime in. It's fine. <laughs> well, yeah, OK, we don't play jazz with our search. You might want to speak a little closer. We, we don't literally play jazz with our search engines but you know we can compose stories or you know delve deeply into the history of some topic that deeply interests us and that's jazz to the mind uh, but you could also play jazz with a search engine if you want to find an electronic instrument or some new you know sound wave spectrum that you can use I mean it, it can enable those things and uh, I just think we should learn how to use them responsibly in a way. I mean, I the, I really appreciated the last question uh, as a father of three, you know, just, you know, my wife and I stay up late some nights wondering if we're, you know, if we made a big mistake in bringing a tablet into the home and, and, and um, well, I don't have the answer for that. Can we play jazz with search engines? That's my question for you all. <laughs> I Is mean, that possible? Last year, uh, an article, I think it was last year, came out where someone tried to hold Google accountable for something that they Googled. Um, and Google <laughs> was like, well, we don't really understand how the search engine works. Like, it's they, they said it was so big that they didn't understand what was happening inside it. And so I think the ability to play jazz on something gets a little bit confused when it gets so big that the people who make it don't even know how it works, right? Um, I might also say that, you know, uh, if, you th if I think about some of the things that I end up doing on Saturday afternoons for far too long and many different hours, 
I search something and then I find something else and suddenly I'm looking at trips to Kathmandu when I started looking at sort of progressive education. And so I think there's something jazz-like about the randomness of what searching can become because you search link to link to link to different thing and there's a kind of a bebop sort of aspect to that which is kind of artful randomness. I think so maybe you can play jazz with the search engine. So Eric, I'm dying to know, how do you feel about the jazz analogy? Uh, Let's hear it. I'm not crazy about it to be honest. <laughs> Um, the way improvisation works, and I'm not an improviser, let me preface by start stating that, but the way it works is you, you master certain tropes of expression, you practice the hell out of those, and then you, you sort of, in the heat of the moment, depending on what's going on around you, you sort of assemble those together. So basically, it's a lot of subconscious and con sort of directed conscious decisions that are sort of combining to, to create a work of art. And my experience of using a search engine and, and going from puppies in, uh, in Kathmandu to uh, kittens uh, hanging from uh, walls in uh, New York is, is not quite like that. In, 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 instead, there's, no, there's not much direction happening. Uh, there is sort of subconscious wandering, but it's, there's, not, there's no higher purpose sort of hanging it, keeping it all hanging together. 